Hey, welcome. I'm glad you could be with me on this journey to the cross, and we're at the cross, which leads us to the victorious celebration, the glorious celebration of Christ's victorious resurrection. A lot of victorious in there, but it is victorious. And we are finishing up our look at Mark's account of the crucifixion, which is the shortest of all of them. Um, and as, as we do that, we come to the death of Christ. And you get to the cry of dereliction. Is that a cry of victory or is it a cry of abandonment? Which one is it? Of course, we're talking about, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So as we look at that, we also see this Roman centurion who declares that this is surely this is the Son of God. So looking at this, we're going to take it up in Mark chapter 15, verses 34 through 39. At the ninth hour, which is around three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, of course, that comes from, that is a quote from Psalm 22.1. Uh, the whole psalm itself is a psalm of uh, pleading with God to intervene on the behalf of this one who is suffering, the attacks and affliction caused by others, uh, wicked people. Uh, and it ends with a, a shout of victory. That uh, And so some argue that Jesus' cry from the cross is one uh, to say that uh, to quote the first verses, to quote all of it and all of that. Uh, and it is really a proclamation of victory, not a shout of, uh, of dereliction or abandonment by God. I take it that it is a genuine abandonment by, by, uh, abandonment by God the Father because... Uh, Jesus is experiencing the totality of what sin does. Uh, he takes sin upon himself. He is experiencing God's wrath on that sin. He does that for our sake. All of sin, evil, wickedness is brought to bear in his being, in his person, and is dealt with there on the cross. If there is uh, a short circuit, if he doesn't experience the separation of, from God the Father, that which is actually hell. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that he goes to hell. I'm saying he experiences hell, hell, the separation, the isolation from God uh, that he experiences in death. That 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 he is ex expressing this this cry of dereliction is a cry of abandonment. It is a cry of of isolation. I take it to be that way. Now, is does that exclude? I'm sure that Jesus knows, and throughout the Gospels, Jesus knows that he is doing the will of the Father and becoming this sacrifice for sin to draw wickedness and sin and evil to, to him in that moment, and that he becomes that sin for us. And, uh, you know, Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Um, and, so, and, and cursed is one who hangs upon a tree. Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree. You die first, and then because the way of killing within Israel is to stone you to death. And then you were hung on a tree, uh, a pole, um, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged is accursed of God, so that you do not defile your land, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. And Paul says in Galatians 3.13, taking this up, about Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that it, in a very real sense, Jesus experiences the curse of God upon him. As we talked about yesterday, the uh, Pharisees, the, the scribes and the chief priests who are mocking him among themselves, he saved others. In other words, uh, the curse did not fall upon them. He forgave their sins, but there's no relief from the curse for him, no relief from sin for him. He's cursed by God. Yuckety, yuck, yuck, yuck. Um, and indeed, he does experience all of that for us. And he must experience that in order to save us from it. To be our substitute, he must experience all of it. But you must, you cannot stop there. You have to go on to Easter Sunday where Jesus is, the 
it, the fact that sin is dealt with is validated by his resurrection, which is what Paul says, declared the Son of God in power by the, Holy, by the resurrection of the Holy Spirit. By his resurrection by the Holy Spirit. So that, you know, you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together in all of that. And that's true regarding all of our, our salvation period. So th that, that is true uh, whatever direction you come from. So that is the, what I take that cry to be. I take that to be a very real cry of dereliction. But I also do not discount that, that in Jesus' mind there is this trust that the Father is going to deliver him. So I think it's both and. I don't think one is exclusive of the other. I do think you must not neglect the reality of the, uh, the, the dereliction of the Son of God, but also the reality of the cry of victory. God, uh, Jesus continued faith and trust in the Father that he would deliver him uh, from, from, from death. And so that's the first part. And then some who the bystanders who are standing around, who, who have stopped to stand around to watch, and there are always those who want to stop and stand around and watch, as they're looking at, they hear the Eli Eli Laba Sabachthani, and they misunderstand it to be that he's calling for Elijah. And there was this idea that is recorded in, in rabbinic literature uh, that Elijah would come and alleviate the the suffering of one who is afflicted and, and that sort of thing. Uh, let's see if Elijah comes. And so it says that, uh, and someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink saying, then they were saying, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Now, that's not just someone. Uh, the only person who could do that is a Roman soldier. Now, there's either one of two motivations. One, this soldier has witnessed what's been going on and really does want to give Jesus a drink. And it was a, it was a, uh, a wine mixed with vinegar. It was a cheap soldier's drink, a cheap day laborer's drink, and it, was, it refreshed thirst better than water did. And so they had this. That was for the soldiers. They were drinking that. And he, he either does it out of compassion to relieve the thirst that Jesus would be experienced on the cross, or he does it to prolong the suffering of Jesus on the cross. We can't know what was what. I prefer to think that he has been affected by what is going on just like the centurion has been affected by what is going on, how Jesus has faced this, his demeanor, his character throughout all of this, which is far different uh, than anybody else who's been crucified before. And I think it had an effect on these soldiers to see him, to see how he faced this and to see what he's going through. Um, so and another thing, it's put on a branch and lifted up to him. Normally, the crucified's feet were just barely off the ground, um, but Jesus was on a cross lifted higher than usual so everybody could see this was a serious crime, and Rome wants everyone to notice it. Uh, so he had to put it on a branch to reach up to him. I won't delve into the significance of hyssop. Uh, that is used to sprinkle the children of Israel and the other things uh, to make them holy. Uh, there at uh, the giving of the law and the covenant made with the people at Sinai, or of uh, sprinkling with uh, Aaron and his sons with the blood, and, and that is done. I think hyssop is possibly significant there, but I can't discern what that significance is, other than how it's related. Uh, to, uh, then, then they did take a branch of hyssop, I believe, and smear the doorposts and lentils with the blood's lamb. But, but blood's not being smeared here. This is a sour wine that's been used, and, and this was a common thing that was around. So he puts this, uh, I can't remember who it is that says it was put on a reed, which quite possibly would have been an arrow shaft and lifted up. So about that far, it's got to reach up to Jesus' mouth. Now, that is not to say that he wasn't being compassionate. It's not to say that he was. I can't discern the soldier's motives. I prefer to think that the soldier has been motivated out of compassion uh, watching this righteous one uh, go through this and how he goes through it. He's not cursing. He's not shouting at them. In fact, he heard him pray for them uh, and how he has faced this and he's heard the conversation with the other uh the other insurrectionist that's crucified with him, and has heard the conversations to to John and to his to his mother, and he's seen this, uh, he's witnessed all of that, 
And so I, I prefer to think he's moved by compassion, that something the Holy Spirit is working in this man's life. God is working in his life, just as with the centurion. Uh, and so he gives him the drink. And then someone says, let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. And so, uh, you know, that in itself is, well, let's just see. Let's see if he's a righteous man or not, because if he is, then Elijah will come. At this point, Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Now, that's just to say that he died. And it's not death like it usually takes place at the cross. Usually, crucifixion victims would die a slow death. They would eventually go into unconsciousness, and they would die slowly. There's no shout. There's no all of a sudden, sudden death like that, uh, that Jesus experienced. And I think that is significant in that he submits to death. Uh, in other places, he commends his spirit to the Father. He is in control of it. Uh, and I think that's true. Uh, so Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last because everything had been accomplished. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The veil that is being referred to is there were two veils in the temple, one that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, and then the one that um, separated the holy place from the outside. That curtain, that veil could be seen when the doors to the temple proper were open, as they would be during the daytime when sacrifices are being made. Anyone could have seen this veil. In fact, it is recorded in Jewish sources and extra-biblical sources that there was an event that took place regarding the veil around this time. Uh, and I happen to believe it's referring to the same time. What does the tearing of the veil from top to bottom mean? How is it significant and tied in with the death of Jesus? Well, it means that the way to the Father now is through the death and resurrection of Jesus, not through the temple cultus, not through the practice of the temple. That, in fact, Jesus said that its time was coming to an end. There is a new temple, and it is him. There is a new place of coming uh, to meet with the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. And in fact, Paul says that he is in the, in the process of building up a temple, and that is the church, the believers, uh, Jew and Gentile alike, that are being made into that because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So the, the, it marks the end, and God is the one who is doing it. It's torn from top to bottom, saying it is completely done. It is wrought asunder. And so th that is an end to that. No longer is that the case. No longer does this is this the way to the Father. Now it is through Jesus Christ. He is the sacrifice. He is the one who makes way for us to come into the presence of God. Not animal sacrifice, not animal blood, not going through priests, but going through Jesus himself. Um, and so that's the meaning of the tearing of the temple. And I think it's significant that extra biblical sources and Jewish sources uh, point to this very same fact that that temple veil was torn, and it was the outward temple veil, not the inward one. And then you have the last part of this, and when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Now that's an amazing statement coming from a Roman centurion. This was a guy who was over all of the death squads. This is a guy who's watched it from the beginning to the end. This is a guy who's been there. He's watched Jesus. He's watched how he's faced death. He's heard it all. He's seen it. And he sees how he dies. Now, we know from other, other gospel accounts that there was earthquakes, there's uh, tombs open, there's all kinds of stuff going on, uh, and, the t and the veil being torn into. He's seen the darkness. He's seen all of this. Uh, and the darkness, by the way, is also an indication of the dereliction of the sun. Uh, but when he witnesses all of this, for him to say, truly, this man was the son of God, uh, Yeah, truly this man was the son of God. That was reserved for Caesar. He's the son of God. To say this is the son of God is remarkable. And, and it, is, it, is, it would be a Gentile equivalent to what Peter has said. You are the son of God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. The same thing. I think this man came to, came to believe that Jesus is. I think he's probably going to pursue this. He's going to hear about it. He's going to pursue this. He was, he was definitely changed by what he saw at the cross of Christ. And I think this other soldier was changed by what he saw at the cross of Christ. Uh, I think there is that, at the cross of Christ, there is that opportunity to be changed and be, and be brought into the family of God. There's the opportunity to reject that and turn away from it, as the, uh, the, the, the chief priests and the scribes did, 
as many of the pastors as I did. But I think there were many who came to faith. I think there were many who believed. I think there were many who were shaken to their foundations by what they saw and, uh, and realized that this is the Son of God. And I think that's the point. We are supposed to come to the cross of Christ and realize that he died for us and realize that he took our place on the cross. And then we go through to that to Resurrection Sunday where he is, he is exonerated, he is validated what he did on the cross in that sin has been dealt with because Jesus is alive. His uh, death Death doesn't keep him. The curse has been dealt with. It was dealt with by him becoming the curse, uh, by his becoming the curse for us. And so, and so we have that, that reality that sin is dealt with, yours and mine. And if we will but receive the grace offered in that and, and believe in him, the finished work of Christ, and trust in that and surrender to him as the Lord of our lives, we will be declared uh, in the innocent. We'll be declared righteous. We'll be declared in the right and innocent as Jesus is declared innocent and right because he became that curse for us. He took that upon himself. That is the most remarkable and most wonderful of the good news is that he has come and he has delivered us if we will but receive that deliverance. Um, and I pray that you have. If you have, then you know forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here and right now, and you know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, you have surrendered to him as Lord and Master, and because of that, you have the shalom, the peace of God to rest upon you. In the midst of all that is going wrong, I am encouraged with things that are going right, and I pray that you are too. Uh, people are beginning to stand up and say, no, we're not gonna have children taught weird and strange immoral sexual practices at, at, at any age, but certainly not in, in little children. People are becoming outraged at these five children and, and hundreds of others that were aborted and found there in Washington, D.C., that are part of an abortion clinic. It's been outed. It's been the light of, of, of day has been cast upon it, and the cockroaches and such are scuttling uh, back into the darkness wanting to cover it up, but I think it's too late. It's been seen that these children were murdered, and that's what abortion is. It's murder, and they were they were murdered, either partial birth abortion or or infanticide after they were born they were murdered and it's just gruesome it's horrible and how can we talk about atrocities being committed by roman soldiers in uh in ukraine when we have this horrible uh thousands upon thousands millions of babies that are killed uh every year and have been since roe v wade um my prayer is that America is waking up, that the light is beginning to shine, that we will turn to Jesus Christ, and that God's people uh, will be revived and lead away uh, in evangelism. That's my prayer. I pray it is your, yours too. Uh, I pray for revival, and I pray that you do too. Hey, listen, my friend, we are uh, closing out this today, the cross of Christ. Next week, of course, we'll be looking at the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, if you don't have a church home, I invite you to come to Troy First Baptist. We have small groups in Sunday school at 9 o'clock, and we have our worship at 1015. And uh, this Sunday night, we're having a special service. It's a narrated drama. It's called The Last Days of Christ. Uh, where um, the scripture is acted out. Scripture is read, narrated, uh, and we have a cast that's acting things out. Uh, it should be an awesome time of worship. If you don't have a place to go Sunday night and you want to come be a part of that, then my invitation, please come. That's at 6 o'clock on Sunday night. If you don't have a church home, come be a part of it. Be my guest. We'd love to see you. God bless you. Hey, listen, I don't know if I'll see you this Sunday. If I don't, I'll see you Monday. Until then, I pray that God shalom, his peace rests upon you always. Be at peace, my friends. See you next time.